Hi folks, welcome back to another edition, I guess we'll call them editions, of Views of Grace. So happy to, uh, to share some more information about this wonderful space with you. Uh, last week, after we talked about the Chapel of the Messiah, I had some wonderful photos sent in uh, by some parishioners uh, who had done some work at the archives. Thank you, Andy shapiro -Zisk. Today, we're actually going to do what we call the crossing. But before we do that, I just we did find a picture after the fact, after last week's con uh, installation of this. And I'd like to, David's going to get a close-up. This, this is the Chapel of the Messiah as it was built in 1912, before the, this, the uh, tile vaulting was added or the stone columns or obviously the, the highly carved Reredos. This was just when the copy of Raphael's Transfiguration was there as the Rarida, or as the uh, sort of altarpiece. And you can see here, there, was, uh, there were some carved medallions which echo what's over the high altar uh, now. So all of that was removed uh, in 1945. We now know that 1945 was when all of the work was done to decorate further the chapel. Uh, so that, that gives you an idea of what it, what it looked like before, a little plain. This memorial, uh, sadly, this marvelous marble tablet memorial, uh, we, we don't have it here at Grace, and, and my assumption is that it was damaged when uh, the work was done in 1945, so that, that, was, that was a loss. But that gives you an idea. And to, to one more point, that's it. when we send these editions out, uh, David very kindly attaches a PDF with close-up pictures of some of the things we've talked about. I'm not sure everybody realizes that. So scroll below the video and you'll see a place to click for the PDF and you can see some close-up pictures. We'll do that for today's edition as well. So today we're talking about the area of the church called The Crossing, which in a large cathedral or even a small parish church would be the area that that actually crosses. So you have the nave with the pews, the chancel with the choir, and then transepts, uh, an extended area, both directions, that would form the cross of the cross. So we don't have transepts here at Grace, as many churches don't, but this still functions as a crossing. In other words, they're not pews, it's transitional space. There are no pews here. Uh, it's before you get into the chancel and the choir area. And so it's space that can be used in a, in a different way. The, the crossing here at Grace is now a little larger than it originally was, even in 1912. Uh, you can see the tile floor where the floor changes. Pews came up to the edge of the terrazzo floor. And so uh, at some point in history, I think about 30 years ago, maybe 30, 40, some pews were removed at the front and at the back of the nave uh, and made more space. So we actually have quite a large open crossing space, which is handy for particularly for concerts and things. When we, when we add an orchestra, there's room to do that. But we're just gonna move sort of from this side to that side, and there's a lot to, to say, and that's why I have my handy stand here because I can't quite remember everything. So the area here at the foot of the Messiah Chapel and at the head of the liturgical, what would be the liturgical north aisle, I think here at Grace it's known as the east aisle, but the liturgical north. This area in 1945, when the chapel was, was highly decorated, as we talked about, this area was developed as a baptistry. So several things happened. This uh, lovely paneling was put in. This was given in memory of a former rector of Grace, Philemon Fowler Fowler Sturgis. I love the first name Philemon, it's fantastic. He was rector from 1960, 1916 to 1926. Uh, obviously symbols of baptism. We have here a boat. Uh, we have over here some fish and it says, by faith with baptism, we enter into the church. Uh, symbols of the dove at the top two sides, the dove coming down representing the Holy Spirit. And if you're good students and remember from last week, another example of linen fold uh, paneling like we saw on the chapel altar rail. So a little bit more linen fold paneling and our ever ongoing lovely vine here. It looks to be a grape vine uh, that continues with some also some Gothic uh, quatrefoils and detailing here above. So this was given in 1945. And the uh, wonderful mosaic floor that uh, David will show you in a minute is, is, was given at the same time and was the centerpiece, the center uh, piece for the baptismal font. So you can see at the outer edges, there are shells, again, symbols of baptism. We have the shells in the floor uh, and three of those. And then this wonderful big sort of sunburst where a font would have stood. So a font given by Mrs. Gamble Cross was placed here uh, in 1945, and this, in effect, became the ba became the baptistry. Now, there was another existing font, older, on the other side of the crossing, 
and we'll talk about that a little bit later, both about what happened to it and, and what became of, of that font. It ceased to be used according to our historical notes, and this became the place that baptisms occurred. So here at the foot of the Messiah Chapel. There, there are a few other details we can just, as we go around, there's some statues that were added later on. I think some of these came from Church of the Messiah. Up here in the window, we have uh, Christ as the Good Shepherd, placed appropriately in the, at the base of the Good Shepherd window. Just up in the window above, we have Christ as the Good Shepherd. These are very difficult to see unless you get really close, and even then, still so. And on this corner, we have a statue of one of the evangelists. We have St. Luke. Uh, why there's just St. Luke, we don't, don't really know. Um, but we know it is St. Luke because he is pictured with a, an ox or a, a bull, which, as we discussed, is the symbol of St. Luke. So here in this corner, we have St. Luke with his attending ox. And David, while we're in this corner, before we get to the other statue, let's just come down and show a, a relatively recent addition. It's been here at Grace ever since Messiah joined with Grace in 2006. But this marvelous lectern of an angel holding up the, the, the lectern stand, um, which was used at Messiah. And it was in the old choir room here at Grace. And we brought it in fairly recently and put it on wheels so we can move it. It's heavy, but so beautiful. So that it can be used at, at our Wednesday Eucharist, which are in this space. The Messiah Chapel is the altar. And, and this baptistry area is where we set up chairs and have Wednesday Eucharist. And then lastly, we have one more statue. Uh, we were just discussing who it is. We don't know. There's no, there's no symbolism on it. I, I assume it's Jesus. Uh, I actually first thought it was Mary and thought that Mary was wearing a, a head covering. But when I got up close on a ladder, it's actually hair, not a head covering. But there are no other symbols of, of any evangelist. So we're going to say it could be Jesus. It could be St. Matthew. We're just not sure, to be honest. And there's a plaque of dedication, but it doesn't say who it is. But come and see, those are things I suspect many of us have not even noticed. So do come look at the Fowler Memorial, the beautiful floor, the statues, the angel lectern, all of this rich uh, uh, artwork and history here in this area uh, at the head of the aisle. And one last thing, David can show us where the piano is. A few years ago, we built a piano garage. We took out some pews and put the marvelous uh, nine-foot concert grand piano there. When I came to Grace... The piano sat in this area and was constantly being rolled around. So really you couldn't see the floor and you couldn't see this area or use it in any way. It's a wonderful piano, but it's serving us better, better over here so that this area is open for use. And I guess, David, lastly, uh, I don't know what originally was here on the Sturgis Memorial. There's a beautiful cross here in the middle, but we've added a new icon. This is relatively new. It's um, the Holy Family. And so a candle burns on, in front of that on Sundays and during the week when we're open, when the church is open. this way um, as we begin to go across the crossing you can see one uh, marvelous world war one memorial tablet on a roll uh, made of bronze and marble so so handsome and a really wonderful tribute uh, to those who died in the war and even um, if david can get a shot even the hymn boards which we aren't currently using because we put the hymns in the leaflet the hymn boards were designed with the chancel in 1912 and the woodwork and the the design of the hymn board uh, echoes that of the chancel furniture. So we move sort of to this area. The, the wonderful Tennessee marble that makes this, this is the parapet, it's called a parapet, has the similar carving that we saw again in the chancel. This was all done in 1912. Really beautiful pink Tennessee marble. marble. Um, and uh, while we're standing here, we're going to talk next about the Eagle Lectern. But the Eagle Lectern originally in 1912 was here. I'll stand there. David can show you how high up this is. So people reading would have come up all of the steps and would have come up here. And the Eagle Lectern was on a, a, a large marble block that raised it up to reading height. So it would have been about here, about three to four feet higher than it is currently. Um, and, and at some point, a number of years ago, by pictures, it wasn't recently, uh, the lectern was moved to its current location and, and the marble block was retrofitted there. 
I suspect that that was because of, of people, maybe particularly elderly people or people with any disability, having issues with getting up all those steps and coming up so high to read. It's quite precarious up there. So now it's a bit lower, a bit closer to the people. Uh, it's a marvelous piece though, given in 1914. There was an eagle lectern before, because we have a picture from around 1900 that shows an eagle lectern, but it was, it was not this. This was 1914, given as a memorial gift. Really beautiful. You can see the, the crown, the marvelous crown image. So the eagle is the symbol of St. John, the evangelist St. John. And John's gospel begins, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. So John and is, is associated with, with the word of God. John's symbol being the eagle, uh, it's often used as a lectern because of that beginning of John's gospel. Another, another theory or another idea is that the word of God is sent out like, the, like a strong eagle taking the word of God out on its strong wings to the world. So frequently in churches, you'll see eagles as lecterns where the word of God is read, either in brass or bronze, wood, um, even in, in marble in some cases, stone or marble. I must say, this is one of the most handsome examples I think I've ever seen. So we'll, we'll cross now from the eagle. There, there's, a, there's a platform here, and at parts, parts of the year at Grace, there is a, a beautiful communion table, which is here. Uh, more, the more modern liturgical thinking of, the, of the, the table being closer to the people. Um, Grace does a unique thing. I think it's quite unique. Um, we're, we're in the Easter season now, and, and that's a time that actually we would be using the high altar from, from uh, uh, Easter vigil through the day of Pentecost, and then again from uh, Advent through the presentation, February 2nd. We use the high altar here at Grace, and the table gets moved, and the communion rails get moved away, and we use the high altar. Many churches have completely abandoned using their high altar, and I think it's wonderful that we continue to do that at Grace. The other seasons of the year, a little bit more time, not, it's not quite equal, it's a little bit more time. We are here at a table with communion rails, which David is near and actually could even show you. These were, these were built, I think, in the 1970s. Very heavy. Uh, these get moved forward into a U shape, and this becomes our, our communion focus here. And then we'll just finish this area that we'll talk about the upper level maybe. So because we're in the Easter season, uh, this, the, our beautiful Paschal candlestick is here during Easter. It lives in this little niche. Um, the candlestick was given just a few years ago in memory of Les and Virginia Fales uh, uh, and was given by their family. And, and this is its home during uh, the Easter season. When, it's, when we're not in the Easter season, the candlestick resides in the Messiah Chapel, and there's a, a plaque there giving uh, its dedication to, to Les and Virginia Fales in memory. And during the rest of the year, or whenever we're at the lower altar here and using this as the communion area, that little niche houses this really wonderful oak um, credence table which was custom made for Grace by Jonathan Brower, who is a uh, master carpenter in Newport and the husband of Megan Brower, uh, one of our great Episcopal priests here in the Diocese of Rhode Island. And Jonathan did, created an absolutely just fantastic piece out of a gorgeous uh, quarter sawn oak uh, with Gothic quatrefoil. And it fits, this was our rector's idea, Jonathan, and it, it was a wonderful idea. It fits perfectly inside this niche, therefore, when we have the credence table there, people can still use the rail if they need it, and, and it doesn't interrupt that. So these two pieces share that little space there, and they alternate depending on the season. And then lastly here, uh, before we talk about the arch a bit, we have the pulpit, again made of t Tennessee pink marble. This is the piece that always surprises people. This was the cram design, the original design when the chancel was built. Uh, it does not scream Gothic. It screams, if anything, Art Deco. <laughs> Uh, and so it still has the wonderful uh, carving that echoes the choir stalls and the, all of the carvings in the chancel. But it's, it's quite massive and, and almost severe. Uh, the marble is gorgeous. Come up and see it close if you haven't. Um, but it's, it's, it really it surprises people. It surprised me the first time I saw it. On the front, and David's about to get there, come around, we have again the evangelists. You might call Grace... We're the church of evangelists and angels. I'm going to do a whole edition on angels, but uh, we have lots of those, but we have lots of the evangelist symbols. So you have Matthew, Mark, these are in Latin here, Luke, 
and John, and there's John's eagle, of course, as we just talked about. And on this last side, David, let's just get a quick look at the Grace Church stone here. Some of you may have seen this. We did a feature on it a few years ago. Uh, I'll read it to you, and we can maybe put it in the PDF. This stone is from All Hallows, Lombard Street, London, founded 1054 A.D., and for centuries called Grass Church and later Grace Church. I don't know how it came to be here, and we don't know that it goes back to 1054, but I would wager it is probably the oldest thing we have here in the church. And if you haven't seen it, you should, you should come up and take a, take a look at that on the side of the pulpit. So I'm going to, several of you have asked about the chancel arch, which is really difficult to see. David's going to back up a little bit and let you see it. So if we, let's close in, and I, I have a picture here. I can actually tell you more about what we don't know about it. We don't know who painted it, and we don't know what year it went in. Um, before coronavirus had sort of taken over our lives, we were had had some discussions with some experts and had some people in about trying to identify the artist, but also about uh, exploring restoration, cleaning and restoration. Um, a few years ago, we had a marvelous photographer from Philadelphia, Brian Kuttner, who took lots of pictures in the church and, and gave them to us. So I have a pretty good, I've blown up one of his photos here, which you can get an idea of the, the colors, the rich colors. There are 37 angels, everything from little cherub heads to full-size angels, and it's near and dear to my heart because it's an orchestra of angels. All these angels are playing wonderful instruments, stringed instruments, trumpets, harps, that sort of thing, all ascending up to Christ seated in majesty with two angels at, the, at Christ's feet swinging thuribles. Uh, oddly enough, Grace Church, which has historically been known as a more low church parish, uh, there are so many thuribles throughout the church. I showed you some up in the chancel. There are more in the windows. Uh, and then there are two here at the foot of, of Christ. So we might be known of, as the church of evangelists, angels, and oddly enough, thuribles, which is really interesting. Um, we'll attach this photo so you can see it in the PDF. It is such a striking piece. And hopefully someday in the future, we can have it restored, cleaned, and maybe even lit in a better way so that, that people can actually see it. But it's a real treasure. I should just say, we, we assume, because we have one photo from about 1900 where the, the, the chancel arch painting is there. It's painted, it's not on the wall, it's painted on canvas and the canvas is attached to the wall. So we know it's late 19th century at least. Whether it dates to the actual 1846 building or to the church, we don't know, but probably somewhere in the 1880s is, would be a guess. So we'll just move over and finish up our, our tour of the crossing. Here we're, we're crossing the crossing. Uh, another, another very handsome plaque. This is from uh, a plaque from 1929. This was the rectors and wardens up to the, that period. Bronze and marble again. And then really one of the most interesting areas of the church, honestly, uh, not sure what the total original concept was in 1912 when this was, when this was built. Though the font, the old font from 1887, which I referenced, was here at one point, and it had, they were no longer using that font. In the 1940s, when the, the Sturgis Memorial was developed and the font was given by Mrs. Cross was, was added there, this font stayed, but it wasn't really used anymore. And at some point they decided if it wasn't gonna be used, maybe they should contact the family. It was the Knight family, K-N-I-G-H-T. It, it had been given in memory of someone in that family. They should contact the Knight family and see if they, if they would want it or if they could return it to them. I don't know what a family would do with that dismal font, but anyway. Um, they, they couldn't locate family members at the time. So what they did was they removed the four evangelists. Here we go again with our evangelist theme at Grace. But each side of the font had a very handsome marble relief of the evangelist. And they removed them from the, from the font. And they put them here at either side of the vestry door. So we think it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, John with the long hair and no beard. I think it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. If anybody wants to correct me on that, you can. I'm, I'm sure that's Matthew, and I'm sure this is John. Mark and Luke, not so sure. 
So they were placed there. And at the same time, we have this uh, large plaque, which I think many people have never even noticed, of the Madonna and Child. And I, I think it's marble. It's hard to tell from here. I think it's stone and marble. And I actually have a post up there, and I'll grab it right up here once you've shown them. If I can hold it under the light. I'm not sure the light helps. Let's see if we can zoom in on that. Again, I think many people have never even noticed this. It's very handsome. Now, the history that I found in the archives about this says that it was it was a gift, uh, and it named the person who gave it, and and it was it calls it a 15th century plaque. Now that's that's pretty darn old, um, and we haven't done anything to to carbon date this. Uh, so it'd be interesting to get some expert opinion on that. It's clearly old. I, you know, 15th century is you know 600 plus years old. Whether that's the case or not, I don't know. Uh, nonetheless, it is handsome and beautiful. And when they did this, put the, these plaques of the evangelists and put that there at the time, this was called the evangelist's doorway, which I think is a very, you know, uh, fitting and proper title. We don't really call it that now. Uh, so then the font was gone and this was sort of blank space. And a few years ago, shortly after I came to Grace, we decided when we moved the communion table over here during the seasons where we were using the high altar, one Easter, we thought, well, let's decorate it. And so we brought out the high altar cross from the Messiah, Church of the Messiah. This was in our vault here at Grace. And the Messiah uh, candlesticks, which we use on the low altar, mostly. So when we have the altar there, there. And we created a bit of a side altar here, a side chapel, as it were, using this wonderful cross with some great detail. And when we're using this big communion table, when we're using that at the, as our low altar, we have another table we bring and replace. So there's always a, a setup of a, of a sort of a side chapel here. Um, we, uh, added the, we added the curtain just to sort of provide a backdrop. Uh, we had some work done on this window re recently. Uh, this, is, this window features King David and St. John. One half of the window is King David, one half is St. John. My, actually, my personal favorite window, just if anybody's interested, really handsome, and it makes a nice backdrop for this for this space. And we added in the corner, the column here comes from Church of the Messiah. It held a bust of Mr. Gamel. Uh, Gamel was a common name both at Messiah and at Grace. And we added this icon of Mary, a new, newer, modern, but hand-painted icon uh, of Mary, which is really lovely. And again, a candle burns there on Sundays and during the week when the church is open. And lastly, this, I don't know where this came from, but this really handsome and beautiful uh, chair, which would be like a presider's chair, uh, a couple of, of haloed angels on the back, uh, and a beautiful sort of Tudor rose design down at the, at the base, and, and a, a blue seat, a, a color often associated with Mary. So we sort of did the same thing with the curtain and the seat, and since Mary's presiding up over all of us here over the doorway. Um, it's it's Grace Church, and I wouldn't go so far as to say it's a lady chapel, but it, it, it's a it's a bit of an homage to Mary here, along with, of course, King David and St. John. Uh, but it's a, an, an interesting space, and people have commented that they have enjoyed uh, yet another opportunity sort of for private prayer, and uh, and, and it, it's enhanced the space, I think. So uh, that's great. So this is how we conclude our, our crossing. So maybe just, David, if you'll zoom back one more time or just take a look that way. We started there, and we've just moved all the way across, and I'll just check my notes to make sure I've forgotten anything. And I would just, uh, last, last reminder, just remember to look for that PDF that we attached to these videos so that you can uh, see some close-ups of some of the things. Uh, I've heard from a lot of people. I've had emails from folks. Please, if you know something that I've left out or said incorrectly, please tell me that. Uh, if there's something else you want to know about, please let me know that. We have, we have lots of other things planned. Uh, there's such great uh, uh, works of art and, and areas of interest. So we'll be back next week with another installment. Um, but it's been really fun doing this with you. And hope you're all having a great week, and we'll see you soon. Thanks.